Let me unmute. You guys ready? My video guys? <laughs> Testing. Hello, hello. Can you all hear me okay? All right, hi. I'm Marlisa Brown. I'm a registered dietitian and I'm a certified diabetes educator. Um, I won't spend a lot of time talking about myself. You can look me up if we need to talk more. I don't want to waste any time. I don't have a conflict of interest in anything that we're going to be talking about today. And if you could just turn your phones to buzz, that would be great. So today we're going to be talking about IBS, um, FODMAPs, and gluten-free diets. Um, I basically like the um, analogy I think of IBS is I don't know. So it's when somebody is suffering from gastrointestinal issues and nothing has come up in the diagnosis, they will say that you have IBS. And it can happen for a variety of reasons, but sometimes it's not always identified. I had a patient that came to me. He was in his early 20s, a very active young man. He used to go hang gliding and white water rafting and bungee jumping off of cliffs and all kinds of exciting things with his friends. And he had experienced some mild IBS, and it got to the point where he started to have to go for runs to the bathroom. So much so that it affected his job. He had to call in sick to work. He stopped going out bungee jumping and white water rafting and camping because he needed an immediate bathroom. He went to the doctors. He had colonoscopies, endoscopes. Nothing was found. He was told he had IBS. They ruled out celiac. They ruled out food allergies. Um, it was actually affecting his total quality of life. With this individual, it turned out that he had a low FODMAP issue. With two weeks following a low FODMAP diet, his issue went away. Sometimes as a healthcare professional, if we just listen a little bit better, we can sometimes identify something that can change somebody's life. And so that's what I want to give you some tidbits today about this, and then you can always dive deeper if you like to, that might help you with your patients going forward. And the, the typical symptoms with the IBS is the gas, the pain, bloating, um, and then you could have diarrhea or constipation, and there's all different types of reasons for it. When you take a look at some of the diseases that are out there right now that they are diagnosing individuals with, 50% of the people that have celiac disease will have these symptoms, but 50% of the people with celiac will not. So just because somebody doesn't have gastrointestinal symptoms doesn't mean they don't have celiac disease. So that's important to know. People that have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and I'm not talking about somebody that went on a gluten-free diet for another reason, but somebody that has non-celiac gluten sensitivity will exhibit gastrointestinal symptoms most of the time. Most of the people that have that will exhibit gastrointestinal, more so than the people that have celiac disease. People that have a FODMAP-related issue or fermented oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polios, 70% of those people will respond favorably if they have IBS to a low FODMAP diet. And these are documented um, facts at this point in time. Now, many people have IBS for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's something serious, something that can make them very, very ill. Right now, with all the social media out there, people are self-diagnosing themselves with a lot of things. They'll see something on Facebook and they'll think that that's what I have. Or they'll see something on LinkedIn that somebody's writing an article and then that's what I have. And what happens is they sometimes delay going in for medical testing because they think they figured out what they have that's wrong. And sometimes something serious can become much more serious. So as healthcare providers, it's important to be up to speed on things and kind of just feed it to somebody you know, it's important for you to get tested. We know you may not enjoy going for these tests. Yes, but if there's something serious going on and you delay treatment, it might be treatable now, but not treatable later. Later. Now, certain things like just underlying digestive issues, it could be Crohn's disease, it could be ulcerative colitis, it could be a diverticular disease that's acted up and gotten infected. Infections can get worse when you have an infection. Your GI system is 70% of your immune system. So no matter what's wrong with your health, your immune system needs to be up to par to be able to fight or deal with anything. So if 70% of your immune system is constantly compromised because you haven't addressed a GI issue that you have, then anything else that you're going to be treated for is also affected. So inflammatory bowel disease, you really only could be found out if you have that if they do tests for that. There's no way that they're going to determine that. They can guess, but they're not going to be sure. Um, gluten or food intolerances, are sometimes done just by elimination diets, not necessarily by testing. But celiac disease is only found by testing. So that's only one way to tell. 
parasites, a lot of times people can have picked up a parasite and they'll think, well, where could I have gotten a parasite? And it could have been just something that they ate that wasn't washed properly that the parasite got transferred to. And parasites can cause gastrointestinal incidents. So if you have somebody that has no gastrointestinal history whatsoever, and then all of a sudden something sudden and hard hits them, and it's not going away like food poisoning, then you can think to yourself, what is it that all of a sudden made this person have a problem, and you might want to rule out parasites. And then, of course, um, and I have a photo, and we'll talk about it briefly later, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is an overgrowth in your small intestine where the bacteria, the microbiome have gone to the moon, and you have too much of one thing and not enough of another, and it causes a tremendous amount of bloating and gas, and it has to be treated. If it's not treated, it stays. And you, even after treatment and you resolve the issue, special dietary considerations have to be made. And, and food poisoning I mentioned, and the FODMAPs I briefly mentioned already. So let me start with the gluten, because this is the item that has been most recently, the last like 12 years, really been out there. People are following gluten-free diets for a variety of reasons. Um, one of the reasons is, is that the World Health Organization established the norms of about how many people do have celiac disease, and doctors have been more readily testing. Previously, they thought it was a very rare disease that was only in children, only with the specific gastrointestinal symptoms that I had mentioned earlier, and, if you did, and, and maybe weight loss and malnutrition. And if you didn't have that, you didn't have celiac. So doctors didn't think many of their patients had it. And so a lot of my patients don't have it, and I'm not going to be spending a lot of time on it. But one in 100 people is estimated to have celiac disease worldwide. In the past 50 years, there's four to five times more people that have celiac disease than before. And the way they found that was, it was interesting, is that they had kept blood samples and samples that they had done of people that had been in previous wars. And they were able to take that sampling and just for the genetic predisposition, see that there was an increase in genetic predisposition by comparing what was done before with, when they checked the samples on the soldiers to today. So they know that there's four to five times more people that are likely to get celiac disease than did 50 years ago. Um, there's a lot of reasons that that could have happened. I have my own personal theory. Um, I figure if you were that sick, you probably weren't having children. And if you're feeling better now, you know, you might be feeling, well, think about it, you're sick all the time. Are you really going, you know, all the time, people that had celiac before that weren't treated that had symptoms were severely symptomatic. They, they might have even died in childhood because of that it was so, it was such a strong, now we know what to do about it. So if we know what to do about it and we treat it, those individuals will be healthy and then they can have more children. But that's just my own personal, um, they have done research and they've checked the wheat and the wheat has not changed. There's no more gluten in the wheat today than there was in the wheat before. A lot of people will say, well, there's more gluten in the wheat. They have samples of original wheat, and they've tested it, and there's no difference. So it's not because there's more gluten in the food supply as far as wheat is concerned. Non-celiac gluten sensitivity was only recognized several years ago. For many years, people would come in and say that they feel better on a gluten-free di diet, and the doctors would say, well, you don't have celiac disease, so it's all in your head. And many times, people were given antidepressants instead of being treated for it. But they were saying, you don't understand. I feel better eating gluten-free. I feel better eating gluten-free. Well, there's no reason you should feel better eating gluten-free. Well, yes, there was a reason they should feel better. They had non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And what that is is an intolerance to gluten even if you don't have celiac. And we'll touch base a little bit more on that in a few minutes. And then, of course, the screenings for um, celiac disease and different types of intolerances increased. The so doctors are diagnosing more individuals. The non-typical symptoms have been recognized, and so they, they identify that. Celiac disease is an autoimmune disease, not a gastrointestinal disease. So a lot of times people that work in autoimmune issues that are doctors will identify it now where they didn't before. And then, of course, there's um, more research. There's more money. Um, they were looking at drugs right now where they didn't before. The drug companies felt if it was something that could be treated with just diet, it wasn't a way that they were going to make money, so they didn't invest millions and millions and millions of dollars. If only a few people have it and I can't make any money working on it, why am I going to do the research? There's research now, and that helps us get more solutions for the future. And then, of course, people are sometimes doing it just for a fad. Um, people say, well, I'm going gluten-free because I want to lose weight. Well, if you went out and bought gluten-free pizza, gluten-free cookies, gluten-free pie, you're going to 
to have the same weight issues that you did if you were not gluten free. Of course, if I just went out and ate whole grains um, that were gluten free, but I ate mostly vegetables and fresh fruits and fish and chicken, yes, I'm going to lose weight. It had nothing to do with the gluten. So it, it does get a little quasi with the individuals out there. And then the FODMAPs. Now this is an interesting, I did an article um, and I talked to um, Dr. Fasano who does a lot of the research on non-celiac gluten sensitivity for today's dietitian. And he was saying, and, and this, is, this was the actual whole quote, but I'll just cut it down a bit. Basically, gluten is a very large um, protein. It has more chromosomes than the human body and more chromosomes than any protein that exists. And that in anybody that's a human, which I think includes everybody here, we can't digest it. So pieces and fragments go from our stomach into our small intestine undigested. However, for the majority of the people, they don't get sick from that. A majority of the people can do okay with these little pieces and fragments. But anybody that has a pre-existing gastrointestinal disorder, or let's say something that's heightened, let's say you're in an acute situation with your gastrointestinal system, or anybody that is being treated for celiac or non-celiac gluten sensitivity or a mild allergy, let's say to wheat, rye, or barley, will have a problem when they ingest the gluten. And so therefore, a lot of people that may not be celiac, that may not have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, may feel better on a gluten-free diet, especially if they have a pre-existing gastrointestinal problem. So it's important to note because it's something that can be easily missed. And sometimes if it's just something that's acute, that's just happening at the minute, when that's resolved, they might be able to digest the gluten safely in the future. Now the history um, is interesting. It wasn't really until World War II where they really got a handle on something about what was going on and they started off with the wheat. And basically what it was is people were starving during the war because there wasn't enough food available, especially in Europe, and there was not wheat available. And people that had celiac disease that had the typical symptoms where they were like basically looking like they were starving to death and always sick were getting better when there was no food and gaining weight where everybody else was losing weight. And then when the war was over, and then there was plenty of wheat again, this Dr. Dickey um, noticed that the people that were celiac, when there was plenty of food, they started losing weight again, those with the typical symptoms. And so the identification of the wheat was made at that time. And it's interesting because they didn't know what to do with people that had celiac before. They had this thing called banana babies, and I actually met a banana baby at one of my talks. And basically, they would take the child from the parent and they would just feed them bananas. That was it. Bananas. They called them banana babies. And if the baby got better, then you got your child back. And, and typically, that was the whole premise for the banana babies, because they found that the children that had celiac, which wasn't identified as that yet, um, got better when they weren't only eating these bananas. Of course, there was many foods they could have eaten, but they found that they thought the bananas was the thing. And so on that particular woman I met, she won't even eat anything that's yellow, ever. It's just like the, just the color disgusts her from that's all they gave her for like six months. Now the and the other interesting thing is they thought that the children would be cured from celiac. Once they got better, it was cured. And so I have met people that have come into my office as patients that told me that they had celiac disease when they were children, but they don't have it anymore. And so they were actually told that, and they actually believe that. And the question is, is did they actually have celiac disease before? Or was it something else? Or do they still have celiac disease and all their autoimmune problems that they're having are related to? And there's something, because um, celiac is an autoimmune disease, so autoimmune diseases cause other autoimmune diseases. So one of the autoimmune diseases that's linked with celiac is non-biliary cirrhosis of the liver. And two of the people that came to me that told me that they were cured from celiac disease from when they were children had a liver transplant because they had autoimmune liver failure that was nonspecific. Interesting. I found it interesting. Um, but we won't know because they didn't want to go back and get tested to celiac at that time. But they had celiac, they still had it. Um, children generally that had celiac disease looking malnourished, we thought if you looked nourished, well nourished, that wasn't something to even look at before. So remember, celiac disease is an autoimmune disease. It attacks you from the gut. Um, if you have celiac disease, you do not have to buy gluten-free shampoo. 
Okay, it's not going in. It's going in through your gut. It's just something important to remember. Now, if I'm preparing things for, let's say, I have a kid that has celiac disease, or I'm a teacher, or I have a child of my own that has celiac disease, and I constantly put hand cream on, and I'm constantly handling food, then maybe I would want to get hand cream that's gluten-free. Or if you have a child, if you can think back to when you were a child, like if you ever ate something that you're not supposed to eat. So like if you could think into your mind and say, well, I know what dirt tastes like, or I know what grass tastes like, or I know what blood tastes like, you know that children put things in their mouth that they're not supposed to put in their mouth. So if you had a child that had celiac, you might want to buy gluten-free soap and things like that because they might put it in their mouth. Try it out. See what it tastes like for today. And this is what the children used to look like, what we used to diagnose. And today, it could look, you could look like anything. And you can virtually be symptom-free, even if you don't think you're having symptoms. So I had a young man that was in my office recently, and his entire life, he would have at least 11 to 12 bowel movements a day. But he thought that was normal, because he had that his entire life. So sometimes people won't think something is wrong, because it's normal for them. Or sometimes people might not tell you what's going on, because it's embarrassing to them. So these were the typical symptoms that we used to look for. Um, in children, it would be short and malnourished. Adults also malnourished, but you can be well-nourished. You could be 250 pounds overweight, and you could still have celiac disease. So why is it linked to so many disorders? Your villi, which absorb nutrients, get flattened out when you have celiac disease. You're not absorbing things. You're not absorbing fat-soluble vitamins, so things like vitamin D, you're not going to be able to make your bones and things like that healthy and strong because you're not going to be absorbing the things you need to make other things happen in your body. Malabsorption issues, autoimmune issues, symptoms vary. Now, if you have five people in front of you and each person has celiac disease, but they don't have anything in common with symptoms at all, it's hard to identify. Like if you have osteoporosis, was it because your mother had osteoporosis or because you and your mother both had celiac disease? And let's say you have gastrointestinal problems and you have thyroid issues and you have arthritis issues, it's hard sometimes to identify unless you get time to talk to a patient at further length to be able to get more information from them that they didn't put on their health history and they didn't even know that was important enough to share with you. They do have research, like I had mentioned, with shots and pills and things. None of them are to the point where it looks like you could just use this instead. So if you go on the Internet and it says you can take this if you have celiac, so you could eat gluten, uh-uh, because that's going to make somebody sick. So it's important to know that those, those medications that they have and the enzymes that they have are not safe for somebody that has celiac disease to ingest gluten. Now, some of the pills in the research are promising, but it doesn't seem to be like that they could eat as much as they want of the gluten. It's more like it will help them protect them against cross-contamination. Now, I'm covering things briefly because I could turn this talk into like three days. Um, so... I'm picking out the things I think are the most important. You certainly can reach out to me at a later date. We can talk about, or I can give you information on other pieces. But even just the drug piece itself could be like an hour talk about all the different types of drugs and such that have been looked at and what they're working on right now. Now, if I was going to go and get screened for celiac because I thought I had it or because my three sisters had it and I had some weird autoimmune issues, I can't just go for the blood work if my house has been gluten-free already or if I decided to be gluten-free already because the blood work will only show your celiac disease even a little bit if I'm eating gluten on a regular basis. So they call it a gluten challenge and they put people back on gluten for four to six weeks and people that are symptomatic, it's really a very difficult thing for them because they get very sick and people are very resistant if they feel better to go back on the gluten. And it's the equivalent of about two pieces of bread every day. It doesn't have to be bread, but I'm using bread as the example. And then you can go ahead and get the blood screening. And just because you come positive on the blood screening, it's not an automatic diagnosis, but at least gives you the idea that this person might be somebody that needs to be tested further. Um, these are the blood tests that they generally use. This is an important note to make right now. Uh, insurance companies have large deductibles. Unless you're very, very poor or very, very rich if you're somewhere in the middle, Many people have $2,500, $3,500 deductible, sometimes even higher, before anything is covered. If you just like randomly start ordering tests on individuals, if you're not careful on what you order, it could use up whatever money they have. Some insurance companies, even if you went in for a CT scan or you went for a colonoscopy, require you to hit your deductible 
before they pay anything. Some people don't have that kind of money. Or they may have three kids and they prefer to use the money that they're going to spend on their kids' medical care instead of their own. So some of these tests are very expensive, and some of the labs do a better job than other labs. So the, the tests that are the ones that are more specific for celiac disease, so that the lab doesn't just go and run everything, is the first test, the IgA tissue transglutonomase, and the, the fourth one down, the DGP, the deanimated gliadin peptide. Those are very specific to celiac disease. You run those two tests plus to the right the total IgA, or well, my right, your left, <laughs> the total IgA, because if the IgA is deficient, it affects the reliability of the other two tests. Those are the blood screenings that are the best to use right now for celiac disease. The other tests are also used, but some of them, again, it adds up. If you run more tests, it costs them more money. On the genetic side of it, the HLA, DQ2, and DQ8 are the tests that you can determine if somebody could even develop celiac disease. So if you don't have that genetic marker, the chances of you getting celiac disease are like 0 000001 so if I had you, if you were on a gluten-free diet because you said it made you feel better, and I said, well, I'm going to put you back on the gluten challenge to see if we can test you for celiac disease, and you know, I don't want to do that because I'll get sick again. I can check you genetically and see if you have the gene. If you don't have the gene, you probably don't have celiac disease. I don't have to make you start eating gluten again. I can look at other things. So the genetic markers do two things. It helps you work with people that have already put them on a gluten-free diet to see if they have a potential to develop celiac disease, and the genetic tests also help you determine if I have anybody that is siblings or children that have the gene. So if I had celiac disease and I had three kids, and I tested my three kids for the, the gluten-free test plus the genetic test, and everybody came back negative, no celiac, but one of my three children didn't have the genes, I really don't need to worry about retesting that particular child again and again and again and again if they have a problem, because they're probably not ever going to develop celiac disease. So celiac disease can happen at any time in your lifetime. But if you don't have the genetic susceptibility to it, you're probably never going to get it. And so it's something that you can just kind of look past and look at other things instead. So, and then again, I'm going to do the diagnostic um, criteria here, and then I'm going to go on to the non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So when you test somebody for celiac disease, the gold standard is an endoscopic procedure. And you need to take enough samples from the duodenal region of your intestines to be able to find it. Because it's not something that's always visible. And if you don't take enough samples, it's spotty like a rash. If you don't take a spot where the rash is, you're not going to pick up the celiac disease. So if a doctor goes in and does an endoscopy and let's say just takes one sample, let's say in the esophagus and two samples in the stomach and one or two samples in the duodenum area, is a potential that you could have celiac disease and still be missed. And to take it one step further, after the doctor does the sampling, even if the doctor took enough samples, if the pathologist that reads the reports isn't a GI specialist, there's a potential that it could still be misdiagnosed. So some people have gone for years and years and years and years, even though they went into testing, because somebody that was testing them, one person, the doctor did the right thing, he took enough samples, but the pathologist wasn't the right pathologist for the job. Because sometimes there's generic pathologists that read lots of reports, and sometimes there's just specific pathologists that specialize in gastrointestinal disorders that are better at reading those reports. And this is what the villi look like when they're flattened. And interestingly enough, they used to look for it where it was always like the skating ring over here. It was just totally flat. But they found there's different marsh standards, and even partial blunting is still villus atrophy and is still a diagnosis of celiac disease. But the old look was if it's not totally flat and it's not celiac disease. And still a lot of people are being misdiagnosed because of the healthcare provider that's doing the test may not necessarily be up to speed with the marsh standards. They're getting better, though, because of the World Health Organization and the research and everything else. So let's say I have IBS. I have I don't know. I don't know what I have. I have something, but they don't know what it is, so it's IBS. And they tested me for Crohn's disease. They did the colonoscopy, and they tested me for, and they did an endoscope, and they tested me for ulcerative colitis, and I got tested twice for celiac disease, and, and they did a CT scan. Nobody found anything. So I decided, because I saw on Facebook, 
Anybody like Facebook? No. <laughs> I'm just using that. People come into me and say they read on Facebook. Somebody told them on Facebook. Somebody told them on LinkedIn. Somebody told them on Instagram. Who is this person that's telling everybody everything? They don't know anything. They're telling everybody everything. So I looked it up and I saw that, oh, I should probably not eat gluten. I have no idea what I'm doing, let's say, and I stop eating gluten. I feel better. I could have non celiac gluten sensitivity. I also can have FODMAP issue because FODMAPs are high, gluten is a high FODMAP item. So one of the FODMAPs is gluten. So when I take the gluten out, am I non celiac gluten sensitive or do I have a FODMAP issue? Interesting item. Now, I will tell you, I do my own thing when I'm working with the patients, because I will tell you, in the 25 years I've been in practice, people keep lousy diaries. And if you tell people not to eat things, you make something up and say, this is what you're going to follow, they substitute on their own. Even though you say you've got to follow just this, this is exactly what you've got to do, I want you to do this for two weeks, you have to do this. They'll come in, you'll say, these are the five fruits you can eat, they'll eat other fruits. Oh, yes, yes, I'll definitely, absolutely, I'll follow. I'm going to be strict, absolutely. If they eat fried chicken, they write down chicken. If they eat grilled chicken, they write grilled chicken. If they, leave, they, they write their journals the way they like. And so it's very hard, like on the elimination phase of the FODMAPs, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, to be able to identify if somebody's not doing what you tell them to do. Some people will lie to you and say they didn't eat it because you told them not to and they don't want to tell you that you didn't, you know. You've got to be like really non straight faced. You can't like make faces and roll your eyes or things because people won't tell you the truth. But they might lie to you anyhow. So just know that there's different ways you have to work this to sometimes figure things out. So I sometimes, if I feel that I want to identify the difference between celiac and, and FODMAP, the FODMAP elimination is much greater. I might give them a 100% gluten-free diet that falls into the foods they like for a week and make sure I address the major sources of cross-contamination so even one crumb is enough to keep somebody sick with non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And at the end of the week, I ask them, like for every day on a scale of 1 to 10, how their gastrointestinal system was, you know, how they felt, what their symptoms were. And if they tell me they have no symptoms or close to no symptoms at all, and I look at what they wrote down, maybe they wrote down an accurate journal for that week, I can lean a little bit more toward the gluten because if they have a FODMAP issue, taking out gluten enough alone would not be enough. They might feel better, but they wouldn't feel better every day. But I have to make sure that I address cross-contamination. I mean, are they using the same peanut butter that everybody double dipped in? You know, are they using the same toaster as their husband? You know, what did they do that could make them sick? that could have contaminated their food with gluten. I have to make sure. But that's an easier one. That's what I do. There's different ways different practitioners do things to figure out what's going on with their patient. So let's have a case. you got a patient here, okay? They come into your office. They say that they have anemia and their blood work for years. They can't gain weight and IBS. What might you ask them? Anything? Throw something out. Don't worry. I pick on somebody if nobody volunteers. Okay, you, you're right in the front. I made you move from the other side. Somebody has IBS and anemia. What might I ask them? What's your typical diet? What might I ask them? I know, she's like, oh my God. <laughs> what kind of tests have they had? What doctors have they talked to? What have they tried so far? Were they born with the anemia? Did it start when they were a little baby, or did this happen somewhere in between? Because if they didn't have any tests at all, and they have IBS, because I found a lot of young women, not as much the men, it's interesting, a lot of the young men that come to me that had gastrointestinal issues have had more tests things done than a lot of the young women. And years ago, they used to say to a lot of women that it was stress, and they used to go toward the emotional thing. You know, maybe you're like really stressed out. Maybe you need to go see a therapist. But they didn't do that as much with the young. And they're a young woman and they look healthy. Most of the time they haven't had a lot of GI tests unless the symptoms are severe. But the guys that come in, I generally see that they've had a lot of testing. So I don't know if it's just a mindset about women and men, I can't tell you. But I know that I've seen it because I've seen over 20,000 patients in my office since I started my practice, and you notice some things that are generalities. So if you have a woman that comes to you 
or man, <laughs> I don't want to pick on, sorry about that, uh, that comes to you, and they say to you that they have like the IBS-like symptoms, what testing has been done? The diagnosis for celiac disease, I told you. The diagnosis for non-celiac gluten sensitivity, you rule out celiac disease, you rule out an allergy to wheat, rye, or barley, you rule out other gastrointestinal issues that we spoke of briefly before, you try a gluten-free diet, if the patient responds favorably, and I mean really favorably, where it's not like they could have been FODMAP and just a little gluten thing, we can look at it as possible non-celiac gluten sensitivity. There are no tests, there are no biomarkers right now for this. There are some integrative specialists that are using stool and things to determine if they think somebody has a gluten intolerance, but it's not mainstream accepted as something that should be used as a diagnostic criteria. So it's a diet of elimination, diagnosis of elimination. Now, with the non-celiac gluten sensitivity, um, the severe gluten reaction is sometimes worse than the people that have celiac disease, and sometimes more immediate. Like they might, like they might make, like somebody with celiac might say they got really sick. Somebody with the non-celiac gluten sensitivity might need to dash to the bathroom, like an emergency run, and really, really bad cramps. That doesn't mean people with celiac disease don't get it, but it's very, very common with the non-celiac gluten sensitivity. The only treatment is a gluten-free diet. We have nothing else right now. When it comes to wheat sensitivities, you can have more than one sensitivity when it comes to wheat. I don't know if any of you have heard of it before. Um, there's something called ATIs. Um, plants have things that are protective things that keep bugs from eating them and things. Um, ATIs are amylase trypsin inhibitors. Wheat makes this and some bugs don't eat them because they make these things. These amulose trypsin inhibitors not only can cause other issues with people that are wheat sensitive, but can also, they've been doing research with schizophrenia, getting very positive results with it, and other autoimmune diseases. They've been finding the ATIs affect people. So sometimes people don't have a problem with gluten, which is the wheat, rye, and barley, and the protein gluten, but something that's in the wheat that's causing some people a problem. So it's sometimes difficult to identify what is causing the problem with an individual since it's coming sometimes from the same plant. Um, food sources of gluten are numerous. People nowadays don't know how to cook as much as they used to. Some people think graham crackers are made from graham. Somebody came in my office last night and said, but graham is a really high fiber cookie that I'm giving to my son. And I was like, no. And then they pulled out Google to show me that there was a lot of fiber. And the husband said to the wife, there's only one gram of fiber in the whole box of <laughs> cookies. So I mean, people don't really know. There is no low gluten containing ancient wheat. So whether it's Fu or, for, um, or Finkel or Felt, they all have gluten. So if somebody has celiac disease, even though some people write articles, I saw an article in Alaska when I was on a traveling thing. I saw an article in one of the food service magazines where they suggested spelt bread for the celiac patients that came in. So if somebody goes in and asks the chef, is it safe, it doesn't mean they always know what they're talking about. And this is how most people that have um, celiac or gluten intolerance or even FODMAPs are given a list. And most people don't even know what it is. Now that gluten's more known, but it'd be before you come home. Did you ever go to the doctor before you were in health care and they told you something that you had and you said what? And they said it again. And you still didn't know what they said, but you didn't want to ask again because you already asked twice, so it's embarrassing to ask a third time. And you go home and somebody says, like, well, what, what did the doctor say? And you have no idea what it was that you were, because they didn't write it down for you or anything, and if they did, you couldn't read it because it was like scribbled out. Or they gave you a list of all the foods you should avoid, which included every kind of gastrointestinal disorder on the same list. It's very difficult when somebody's under anesthesia and just had their endoscope procedure and just recovering when somebody comes into the room and gives you the list of the foods you can't eat to really ask a really interesting question to get into more detail about it. As a healthcare provider, you need to have a better action plan if you're working in an environment where you're diagnosing people and giving them information. You're not going to, when you get discharged from the hospital and they give you all that information, anybody ever been in the hospital? Okay. When you go in the hospital and you're leaving or somebody else is leaving and they go through everything, it looks like you're following them. You know, you're listening and what is the thing that people are thinking in their head when they're getting discharged from the hospital? What's the one thing people are thinking in their head? I want to go home. I can't get to get home. When am I going to get out of this place? It smells in here. Your food stinks. What are people thinking? They're not even listening. They think they're listening. They can go home. You call them the next day to take the pills. What pills? Are they supposed to take pills? They don't necessarily hear you. 
So you need to have some sort of an action plan in place that can help the people follow up after discharge. Hidden gluten can be in anything. I would just want to point out that thickening agents are a problem. If somebody has Parkinson's disease and celiac disease and they're bedridden and they get diarrhea when they have gluten, do you want to give them a thickening agent that has gluten in it? But we've done that for many years with things like sorbitols and medications to people that had chronic diarrhea issues. We were giving them medications. We used to look and search to see if the medications had sorbitol in it because we gave them things that made them have more of a problem without even really thinking twice about it. It wasn't that we did it on purpose. It was just something that happened in medical care. The biggest problems you're going to find when working with a patient, family members are not always understanding as they could be. They're not. Some family members are, but not necessarily all of them. When you go out to a restaurant, just because you tell somebody that you can't have something, whether you're diabetic, high blood pressure, gluten-free, whatever it is, it doesn't mean that they know what you're talking about. Schools, kids that have celiac or not celiac gluten sensitivity, how much are they accommodating for it? What about parties? What about class trips? Are the snacks on the bus? Do, the, do they have to sit in a separate room to be safe? What is the peanut allergy? You know, what are they doing really to make this child feel comfortable? I mean, just think about it. What about bullies? If I had a peanut allergy at school and you were a bully, you might say, I'm going to blow peanuts on your food. You know, the kids are not always good kids. All of them. <laughs> some of them are, but some of them aren't. What are you going to do to make it so the kid has, the child has the same experience as an adult? What if I have diabetes and celiac disease? Did you know that 15% or more of the people with type 1 diabetes have celiac disease? Did, and that's documented. If you go to the American um, Diabetic Association, they have standards of care that come out every year. It's standard in there that everybody with type 1 diabetes should be checked annually for celiac disease. What if I have celiac disease? and I took too much insulin, and I'm in a restaurant. What's usually on the table? What do they give you when you sit down in a restaurant? Can I eat that? Can I eat the bread? No. If I told the waitress I need something for my diabetes to drink, would they bring me a regular Coke or a Diet Coke? I'm diabetic, right? Am I not supposed to have, I should have, sugar, I should have the sugar-free <laughs> products. It's very difficult to accommodate to somebody when the things are not easy. If it's a busy restaurant, you ever try to get somebody's attention when they're really busy and they, they're really deliberately not looking at you because they're really busy and you need something? Most of the things that are available that are quick, if I was in Disney walking a lot and I took too much insulin, is there gluten-free things I can grab right away easily available? You just, I'm just saying it's harder. Disney does have a lot of gluten-free things, but it might not be at the place that I am in Disney. Um, after surgery, what do they usually try to give you when you come out of surgery before they take you out of the recovery room? What do you have to do before you get out of the recovery room? Anybody know? They make you pee first. You have to pee. <laughs> they have to do that. And they want you to eat something. They try to give you crackers. So even if you were in pre-surgical and they told you 45 times, you told them, I can't, because usually there's like seven people that come in. They scan you to make sure you're you, and then they ask you over and over and over again the same question. Same question. Next person comes in, same question. Next person. You tell them, I just told five other people, I know, we got to do that. They do it again. And you tell every single person you can't have gluten. And you come into the recovery room, and the nurse will come over usually and give you crackers, even though you told seven different people that you can't eat it. So I actually don't eat gluten. I'm non celiac gluten sensitive. And I had gone in for a small procedure in the hospital, and I told all seven, 12, whatever amount of people that came in I couldn't have gluten. And they come into my recovery room, and they're trying to make me eat crackers. And I was a little groggy, you know, for the medicine. I was like, no, I can't. No, no, honey, really, give it a try. I said, no, no, you don't understand. I can't. No, you can have a cracker. I said, do you have any applesauce? Because <laughs> I knew, you know, what the, but what if, if after somebody else, if you told seven people and they gave you a cracker, maybe you would have thought, hey, maybe it's a gluten-free cracker. I told seven people. And what if I just had some surgery on my gastrointestinal region, now I eat the regular cracker, and I'm somebody that has gastrointestinal symptoms? It's a problem. Now, there are a lot of gluten-free foods. The problem is, oops, is that we mix gluten into a lot of the healthy gluten-free foods. And that's a problem that a lot of people have. And even though most people tell me that they eat fruit and vegetables, when you look through their journal, if they actually keep it for the week, you may find that they had broccoli three times and that was the only vegetable they had for the week. Or they might have had some baby carrots with their hummus. But most of the time, people eat a lot less produce than they think they do. And so even though produce is safe, but you know what? If everybody else is having cannoli cake, maybe I don't want like a fruit salad at the end of the wedding. 
And so this, you get sometimes, we have found in research that um, people get sometimes angry and depressed and don't go out and don't enjoy events anymore because they don't know how to make accommodations to make their life better. And as a healthcare provider, even if you're not the specialist, you can refer them to somebody that is that can help their life better, even if it's a support group like um, the Celiac Support Association, and I'm on the chair of the local group for the gluten intolerance group, they have support group people that will help you tell you what to do to get through these situations so you're not depressed and that you do go out and you have fun like everybody else. And just keep in mind that um, gluten-free um, diets where they make those cookies and pies and everything, a lot of times they're just putting starch and unnutritionally valued foods to make those cookies. They'll use cornstarch and potato starch and other things to lighten up those dense gluten-free flours, and you could throw that food against the wall if you didn't put those things in there, but it's not as healthy as the whole grains. There are plenty of gluten-free whole grains, and again, I'm happy to share more with you later on this. And tapioca, even though it's a starch, does have fiber in it, but in general, if you don't have a variety of gluten-free grains, you're definitely getting nutritional issues that you're not having enough food with healthy things in them. And important to note, in this country, we fortify wheat with iron and folic acid, but most of the gluten-free products are not fortified. So the people that are celiac eating all packaged foods may be more likely to have some sort of deficiency because of the fact that they're not getting the same amount as everybody else. And then as far as, I just want to make quick notes on this. On molded cheeses, they used to say not to have it because to make blue cheese, you feed it bread and it, that's how you feed it. But it's just like a cow. a cow. If a cow eats wheat, it doesn't mean that if we eat the cow, we're eating wheat, we're eating cow. So the cheese eats the wheat, so the cheese is okay. But a lot of times you'll go to a restaurant and they'll say no blue cheese or something because they read somewhere that it's not safe. The molded cheeses are safe to have. The ditto for the oats, the problem with the oats is cross-contamination. They grow them in the same fields. They put them on the same equipment. They transport them in the same machines. And so, therefore, oats are generally contaminated unless you get certified gluten-free oats. That's just something to know. Um, we have foods now that are labeled for allergies. The eight common, most common allergies are labeled, but that's only on food that's unpackaged on the shelf. Meat and fish and things like that do not have to be following the FDA guidelines. They follow USDA. So it's recommended that USDA products follow the guidelines of the FDA, but they don't have to list allergy ingredients on their label if they don't want to. So if you see something that has a lot of ingredients in the meat aisle and they don't have any allergen declaring statements there, that means they're not declaring the allergens. It's not a safe food for somebody that has a food allergy, wheat allergy, gluten-free allergy, gluten sensitivity, unless they call the manufacturer. Now, I don't always say, like, use Google or something like that, but if I Googled, are M&Ms gluten-free, it will usually take me to the Hershey's website, and it will say, oh, yeah, they are. Okay, so that's one way to use Google effectively. You know, what if somebody brought you stuff and they said, I got this just special for you, and you want to do a quick check? You know, might not always be able to call. And so then just consider, this is one of the points that I just want to make briefly, is that gluten-free labeling laws are intact right now. However, um, not all foods that are gluten-free have to be labeled. It's elective. So there's a lot of products that are gluten-free that are not labeled gluten-free. Gluten-free products that are labeled gluten-free are supposed to be less than 20 parts per million contamination of gluten. However, testing is not mandatory. So it is possible that somebody could buy something that's gluten-free that the manufacturer didn't test and it could still be contaminated. So if somebody looks like they're being really careful and still being sick, all the time, then get temporarily only certified gluten-free packaged foods to see if they get better. And if that's the case, then you know something that they're having, that they're buying, has not been tested or, and, or is not safe for gluten-free. I know it's a terrible law like that way, isn't it? I mean, you have to be less than 20 parts per million, but only if you get caught, you're going to be in trouble. So if you don't want to test. So like if I went out, if I was not knowledgeable, and I said, well, I'm only going to buy rice flour to make my cookies so they're gluten-free and I'm going to label it, what if my rice flour was contaminated? Okay, I'm not testing my product, but I'm labeling it gluten-free. So it's, it is a problem in some cases. There are certification groups that certify by testing the gluten-free product. So if it says certified, you know it's been at least tested. I just wanted to go through that. Let's quick, quick patient, then we're going on to FODMAP. Somebody comes to you with celiac. They follow a gluten-free diet 100% of the time. They're always sick. What questions? Somebody? Where do you get your food? Sure. What else could you ask them? They're sick all the time. 
Was there any other problems going on? How safe is their food in their house? Are they contaminating it? Um, I've had several people that came to me with celiac and FODMAP sensitivity at the same time. What do you do in meal planning? Most people like to eat the same things over and over and over again. Change is not easy. If you've ever tried to change something, whether it's biting your nails or not biting your nails or um, go on a diet, it's very difficult to change. People get very sad when you take away their favorite food, especially if you tell them ever. You can never, ever, 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 ever have this again. Usually if somebody tells you you couldn't have anything anymore, you want it more. It's something to consider. It's better for persons in RD when they do gluten-free. Um, I gave you something on certification on FODMAP. You can get certified in areas for gluten. You can get certified in areas for FODMAP. Um, just because somebody's a dietitian doesn't mean that registered dietitian knows a lot about gluten. So the, the more important thing is make sure the person that's helping them with the diet is somebody that really knows about the diet. So even a support group member might be better than a dietitian that doesn't know enough about gluten. And, and I don't mean to say it that way, but there's been a number of times that there's been issues that, that have come up, so I know that that could be a problem. Make alternatives for a person that comes to you that are aligned with the food that they like to eat. That's the most important thing you can do. Make a list of places they can go that they can get similar things that they enjoy. If you don't know it, ask the local support group person to put that together for you. They're happy to do that for you. Um, there's lots of things you can use, gluten-free flour, gluten-free broths, salad dressings, condiments, gluten-free bread comes in the freezer, gluten-free bread. There's not a lot of things you need to make the food gluten-free. You just need to teach somebody or have somebody teach somebody how to do it or where to get it. I made these different foods. They're in one of my books. Um, I can just see these are all gluten-free foods that were prepared. Those are the garlic knots. Look at those. Yum. They, they were good. I did a demo with this at Ice Culinary School, and I stuffed them with prosciutto and uh, mozzarella cheese. It was culinary school. This is for when people tell me they don't like fish except it's fried. I show them if they can do fish that's not fried. These are pigs in a blanket that actually taste like pigs in a blanket. I want you to know I made enough of those pigs in a blanket to give samples out to 100 people for one of the gluten intolerance group meetings. There was only 30 people there. They ate everything. They even took the dough I was using at the demo that I would touch and had on the counter to take home so they could make more. Okay, when you give them something, even though this is not considered a gourmet item, something to somebody that can't have something ever, and you give them something that they liked before and they didn't have anymore, they are going to town. That's a problem, too. If you never get dessert, you finally get it, you want to eat it more. And that's a problem. So if we can give them things on a regular basis, it will help them with healthier eating. Um, again, that was a pesto sauce. That was a cream soup. This is a scone. That's a pumpkin pie. All gluten-free. So cover up things for all meals, events, dining out. It was Thanksgiving last week. Imagine if they bought a, a, a turkey that had gluten in it even. You couldn't even have the turkey. Self-facing turkeys have gluten. Like, I'm not going to say a brand. I'll tell you after. This is that cracker thing I told you about. And these are other issues with the hospitals and, and outpatient. Hospice doesn't have special. Now, you could say, well, somebody's dying. They're not going to eat much. Some people go into hospice because they have a life-threatening illness that's, that they feel that they're going to die within a six-month period. But they have, when they have a bad incident, sometimes they end up in the hospice center. But sometimes they live a lot longer. And they're not able to eat. And the people that are volunteering to bring in the food don't always know what to do to give it to them. Imagine getting sick when you're in a hospice environment to try to resolve an issue. Meals on Wheels, institutional eating, they don't, they don't cater to these things. Um, imagine if you went into the, like, the local hamburger place and asked them what they fry in the oil. I mean, some questions and answers you get back from, health, um, from people in restaurants is not always nice. One of my patients went to a restaurant. I won't say which type. We don't want to pick on ethnic groups or anything. Some groups are definitely nicer than others, let's just say. Um, Americans are worse than the other groups. <laughs> Shame. <laughs> uh, the Americans seem to make sarcastic comments back to the people in the restaurant, where the people from ethnic groups, generally, not all of them, okay, tend to be more accommodating. They go in the kitchen, I talk to chef, blah, blah, blah. Mary, you know, I went in the kitchen, I told the guys in the kitchen, they're laughing, man. I mean, you said you want to know what was in the oil? They said everything's in the oil. I mean, they'll come out with an attitude. I mean, I don't know what that's about, but it's absolutely the case. These are, these are sources of cross-contamination. Um, the biggest sources in the house would be the toaster, um, double dipping, and colanders. Those are the biggest sources um, for people to get sick. And um, let's talk about FODMAPs. A lot of people that think they have non-celiac gluten sensitivity are actually suffering from FODMAPs because of the FODMAPs being so high in gluten. 
And what are they? Five what? Most people, I have to write it out for them. They never heard of it before. And it's basically carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates, you know, single or double group carbohydrates. And these are the different categories. And most of us are familiar with the disaccharides of lactose. Because a lot of people have had lactose. And we've come up with a pill for lactose. So it would be great if maybe we, in the future we can come up with a pill for some of the other FODMAPs, but they're not there yet. The oligosaccharides, I mean, they make fun of these things in the movies sometimes. The beans are the lactose really, really high in oligosaccharides. So if somebody comes in to me and they always had IBS and they tell me, especially when they have onions and garlic, clue, or somebody tells me that they can't tolerate gluten, they don't have celiac disease, but they still get sick, especially when they have Italian food, big clue. Not everybody is sensitive to every category in FODMAP. So if somebody gives you a clue, like every time I have ice cream and milk, I have to run to the bathroom, and they only say ice cream and milk, we can at least start off on something simple, like just let's try the lactose thing first, or let's just try the low oligosaccharide thing first. But you know what's funny about the onions? The green part of onions is not a problem. It's the white part of the onions. And in the garlic, if, if you make garlic infused oil where you like simmer garlic and water, uh, not water, oil, and then you dump out the garlic but you keep the oil, it tastes like garlic. That doesn't make them sick. It's the actual fructose that are in those other components that makes them sick. So the things you can do to food to make it more tolerable in the foods that they like, but they'll give you clues. People will give you clues. So when it comes to things like fructose, all fruits do have fructose, but some fruits have a lot more. So let's say it's cherry season, you know, and, they, and the person says, oh, I love cherries. I'm having all these cherries. Well, cherries are really, really high in fructose. And if they say, like, all of a sudden, I always have an IBS problem, but, like, the last couple of months, what have you been eating a lot of the last couple of months? Because maybe they really bumped up, or maybe they went to some honey, honey farm, some organic honey farm, farm and brought home a lot of honey, and even though they could tolerate a small amount of honey, now that they got like 25 jars Costco size in the house, you know, you know when you get the Costco size, you eat more. Like if you only had a couple of chips, and you, you know, like a little bag of chips, you gave me three chips, those three chips I'm going to eat really slow because I only have the three chips. But if I had like a giant bag of chips, you know what? You're going for the fist. I mean, how many people go in for the fist of chips? Come on. Okay. I mean, if I only gave you two chips, you're going to eat those chips or two M&Ms. You're not going to eat them as fast. But if you have a giant family-sized bag, it goes down faster. So when this cherry is a watermelon, you know, like a lot of it in the house, ready to go, and all of a sudden somebody's telling you that they're getting sick all the time, what have you been eating a lot more of lately? Because it can help you identify maybe that category is a problem for them. And maybe they're okay with one piece or one cup of watermelon, but if they had two cups of watermelon and two cups of cherries, maybe it's over the top. Or maybe they had agave or high fructose corn syrup and everything. Like they say, I can't tolerate salads. How much salad dressing do you put on your salad? A lot of the salad dressings have a lot of high fructose corn syrup. It's a clue. So the clues help you get to a place, and sometimes you can just take out one thing instead of the typical thing about taking out everything. These are polios. Notice that most of the polio foods have stone fruits. The stone fruits here, like the apricots, and the, um, the avocado is not a fruit, but it's a stone. The cherries... Um, Cherries have both the fructose and the polyols. The thing I gave you out from Monash University on the back of that one sheet, and they're on the chairs if you didn't get them later, um, they have an app. It's like a $10 app or something like that. You can actually filter out a category for somebody so they can get the foods that are highlighted in red um, easily. In other words, you don't have to go crazy with that. Sometimes people can't tolerate FODMAPs because they have a secondary problem. I mentioned earlier the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth where the bacteria is growing in the small intestine. This particular woman is a size 1. She sent me a photo of her stomach. Does she look like a size 1? This was after she ate something. She said this is what was going on with her stomach. She was much more of an obvious case. So we had her tested. She found out she had SIBO. A lot of people that have the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth after treatment still have to, they need to follow a low FODMAP diet. Once she felt better, guess what she did? She went town again back on the FODMAP. This came back again, and it's not going away as easily as it did before from treatment. So people that have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth sometimes can't tolerate large amounts of FODMAP. Um, recent research has shown that people that were self-diagnosing non-celiac gluten sensitivity, 
they gave them a diet that was with gluten, low FODMAP, with gluten, high FODMAP, without gluten, low FODMAP, without gluten, high FODMAP, and they actually found out that a lot of the individuals were able to tolerate small amounts of gluten without a problem. It was really the total FODMAP that they were having a problem with. And it was probably the category, because you notice back at the oligosaccharides where the garlic and the onions were, was the wheat, rye, and barley was there also. So it's just interesting. So how do we do, deal with this? What do we do with this when people come into us? They don't have all the foods even tested. So you really, not, they're still testing. A lot of, and the bread that they sell in Australia is not necessarily the same as the gluten-free bread that we sell here. Most people that have a FODMAP-related issue will generally follow a fairly low FODMAP diet, even when they identify the problem, and then really watch the one category or two categories they're sensitive in. But how do we deal with it? What do we do? I mean, the FODMAPs, when they have a problem, it kind of like pulls water to the gastrointestinal, real problems with gas, real problems with gas, and bathroom-related issues. I mean, certainly rule out something serious, as we mentioned earlier. If somebody's bleeding, or they lost a tremendous amount of weight recently, or they're vomiting, or they have, like, other really se severe symptoms, don't start playing around with diet. Make sure that they get medical care. Some people don't even know that they moved, and they have a new doctor. They don't even they just go to urgent care. Nobody's following them regularly. You need to make sure somebody helps them find a doctor. Search online for local doctors and find somebody that takes their insurance. Encourage people to get the right care. When somebody has a FODMAP-related suspected issue, there's different ways they do it. Sometimes they just go to the doctor and they give them a list of all the FODMAPs and say, don't ever don't eat these anymore. And it's huge. It's all those things I saw on that list I showed, every little one of those plus. And they're not even always alphabetical, you know, and they're not always making sense. Patients don't know what to do with that. We can take out the foods that they're sensitive from and put them back one at a time. If I think it's lactose, we can take it out, and then we can put it back and see what happens with that. We can go on a low FODMAP diet, completely take everything out, and then put foods back in one category at a time. You have to make up meal plans for them. We can keep careful records with an individual if you get somebody that's good at that, and then review the records and see where they isolated things that they're having a problem with. They do have breath tests for FODMAPs. The problem is, is some people come up positive but don't have symptoms. So, you know, you can't just do the breath test and say, okay, don't eat fruit toast anymore because that person might be able to tolerate it. So let's say you have a patient. They come to you. They got that huge low FODMAP list from the doctor. They said, this is what they were told. What do you tell them? What do you help them with? Well, if it's a huge list and they can't follow it at all, you can make up a simple meal plan for them that you make up yourself, you know, based on what they usually like to eat, that's low FODMAP and say, just eat this this week. And then next week I can add one category in. Most people wait two or three weeks like that. They tell you to wait two or three weeks. Most dietitians that specialize, most patients don't have the patience to do that. So if you want to do one week and then I'm going to add back, let's say, some of the oligosaccharides and see if they react. If they told me, they gave me the clue and said they can't do onions, I might say, do me a favor. Try some green onions with your salad. Tell me if you have a problem with that. Try some garlic-infused oil instead of garlic, and don't use the regular salad dressing. Tell me if you have a problem with that. I can add things and play with them in my own way to see what the response is so that I can help direct them better. If somebody came to my office and they knew they had a low FODMAP issue, uh, but they haven't had any gastrointestinal consults, is it that they're having a problem because of the FODMAP, or is the FODMAP just exacerbating something that's existing? So if they're having any of those other symptoms that could be dangerous, you want them to get tested further. You want them to go to the doctor. I understand colonoscopy isn't like the first thing. I can't wait. I'm going on Friday to have a colonoscopy. I mean, people are really looking forward to that, excited to get their colonoscopy. People complain about the co not just the procedure, the, 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 pre the prep. They don't want to do it, you know, so you have to, like, try to, like, negotiate with somebody to get what you want. Like, say, don't offer them horrible results. Don't say, say, look, we really want to make sure that it's nothing serious. So this way we can, if it's something going on, we want to take care of it right away. You want to try to negotiate with them. People have a right to do whatever they want. And so our jobs are to try to get them to be either happier about what it is that they have to do or make them want to do the things that they didn't think they wanted to do. By telling them to do it isn't always the way to work. You've got to work around them. It's like a little motivational. That's why you all did like counseling skills and motivational interviewing and things like that when you work. 
it's like the little things that you got to like, it's how you say it, not what you say. You know, did you ever go into the doctor and they turn their back to you when they come in and they're typing in their little thing over there? It's like, no, but you, the eye contact, the personal contact, hello, my name is, you know, anything that you can do to connect better to your patient. When it comes to the meal planning, let's say somebody had that cherry suspicion <laughs> that was going on um, or somebody had a problem like particularly like, like when they were having beans. You know, the canned beans are less of a problem than the fresh beans. And chickpeas are less of a problem than some of the other beans. So maybe I could say this week, why don't you just do chickpeas since you like a lot of beans, but only do a little bit every day and see how you feel. Like you can play around with some of the things that people tell you about. It's a question of total load, not a question of total avoidance. Some people that have lactose intolerance can have small amounts of milk without a problem. Other people can't have anything. You need to be able to find out what somebody can tolerate. Some people don't cook. Some people do cook. They do make now, thank goodness, FODMAP. Ooh, who did that? Never do that. Did you see what I did? What didn't I do? It's actually pretty funny. I actually have my phone off. Shh. I'm an old person now, so I don't have the skills that a young person has to easily do this with one hand. So this will be good for my video, <laughs> what to do and what not to do. Um, the garlic-infused oil, homemade salad dressings, they now have happily low FODMAP salad dressings, tomato sauces, packaged bars, and foods, drinks that are low FODMAP that we can recommend to patients. There's companies that are selling low, just like the gluten thing started to go. There's a lot of companies now. When I went to the American um, Dietetic Association conference a few months ago, they were talking all over the place on the exhibitor floor about different products that they were low FODMAP. So people that don't cook can buy salad dressings and tomato sauces and drinks that are gluten-free and low FODMAP without a problem at the shows now. As we get samples, I ask people for samples. I'm getting boxes in my office every day of all different kinds of samples to give out to patients that they can try and see if they can tolerate them safely. The gluten-free flour blends, most people that are low FODMAP will go gluten-free because gluten is such a high FODMAP item. So they'll generally order gluten-free breads and flours. But you might see them when they're in a restaurant. They might take a couple of spoonfuls of somebody else's pasta, even though it had the garlic and the regular pasta. They might eat half a piece of a bread because they're not celiac, they're not non-celiac gluten sensitive, they just have to reduce the amount that they're having. So there's the thing about the total load. And so when it comes to lower FODMAP fruits and vegetables and lower FODMAP sweeteners, if a recipe calls for honey or agave, I could use maple syrup. And interestingly enough, white sugar is actually safer than brown sugar. Um, the artificial sweeteners, the sugar alcohols, are a real problem. So you have to just watch out for that. Alcohol, like margarita mix, probably high FODMAP. Um, the beans, like I said, the canned beans are better. Individualized for each person. So here's a recipe. All right, this is the only homework thing that we're going to do now. Ready? What should we take out to make this low FODMAP? Anybody think of anything here? The onion, yes. We'll put green onion, right? Instead, so salt, pepper, cilantro, Feta cheese is only a little bit in there, not that many olives, some lemon juice. Sun-dried tomatoes are a little concentrated, maybe. Maybe we could do cherry tomatoes if they have a problem with that, you know, because it's concentrated like a fruit almost, like a dried fruit. And that's, that's what we would do. What about the next recipe? We have some risotto here. Olive oil, shrimp, sea salt, black pepper, onion, okay, garlic, the garlic-infused oil. Rice should be okay. Wine should be okay. Chicken broth. The peas, sometimes it's in the bean category, but there's not a lot here. A little bit of Parmesan. I really think that if we just went with a few items, the onions and the garlic, we should be okay. The honey grape carrots is a little recipe, but what's in there? We've got the brown sugar. We could do white sugar. We could put honey. We could put maple syrup. We could put a little bit of honey so we get the honey taste. And that's it. So it's not really that horrible. This is one that's got heavy stuff in it. Lots of recipes. It's got green onion already. It's got carrots, and it's got celery, and it's got potatoes and it's got crab meat, the half and half. Some people might have a problem with that. Some people might not. You could use rice milk. You could use almond milk, unflavored, <laughs> you know, the unflavored one. Vanilla wouldn't work. Um, but when you look at it, 
we could use coconut milk. We can change things. We don't have to give it to Like when I did this one book, I'm going to probably give one out when we're finished to whoever wins. Um, I took all FODMAPs out of every recipe as a suggestion, you know, like for modifying. If I have a problem with just one category, we only have to, if I only have a lactose intolerance, we only have to take out the lactose. If I have an oligosaccharide, I could reduce or eliminate the oligosaccharides. I don't have to take everything out, but all the FODMAP cookbooks take everything out. So you can identify if a person doesn't have a problem with something and tell them it's okay. Um, remember that a lot of the dietitians that specialize in FODMAPs will tell you three or four weeks without the FODMAPs to let your bowel and you, you've got rest and then they'll put the things in. Most patients will not do this, even though they say they will, unless they are severely ill. Um, if you introduce one category at a time, you give patients a safe list of FODMAPs. You have them try to keep a journal and mark whenever they have a GI reaction. You can even have them circle things on a list of high FODMAP foods of what they think the problem is. It helps you resolve issues for them. You always want to try to identify the foods that have the reaction. Um, it's all a question of the load. There's lots of resources out there today. Um, I like um, a lot of things from Australia, from Monash University. I like Patsy Katos' items. I gave this information to Anne so that she could share that. You know, it's on the, the material I sent. Um, there's also, I like, um, Kate Scalardo had some good pieces. She had, a, um, Anne had something that she sent to me that was a terrific piece that I took a look at that looked like a nice piece. There's a, a million places that have information on how to do meal planning and recipe modifications for people that are low FODMAPs. Ditto for the gluten intolerance. They have free kits they give out to people that are newly diagnosed. Char has a lot of um, kits that they put out. Um, there's, there's organizations that do research on, on different types of studies. So if I went to, let's say, Columbia University in Manhattan, they have a big re celiac research center. They have all the research that they're looking at currently, information available on their celiac website. Um, the, the SPRU, the Celiac SPRU Association, the Gluten Intolerance Association. If I was going to go to Kansas and I wanted to have some go out to eat, I could, I could text message or email the president of this group and say, could you help me? I'm going to be in the area. What could I eat? They're helpful. Um, there's an app, Find Me Gluten Free, for people that are looking for restaurants that show restaurants all over the country. A lot of the restaurants that are catering to one thing will usually try to accommodate other things. If you go into a restaurant and they don't want to accommodate one thing, they usually won't accommodate anything. They're like very difficult. Like if they're difficult, they're difficult across the board. If they're helpful, they're helpful across the board. So that's important to know. You can ask more questions to a restaurant where they're caring and they're helping you than you will somebody who doesn't even really act like they want you in there. And these are again some support groups and such. And there's the Columbia University and there's also, they have all different universities. They have in Maryland, they have in Virginia, um, different, a couple of groups they have in Chicago. Um, there's Dr. Guardolini, there's Dr. Green, there's Dr. Fasano, major, major doctors that are doing research and are well um, known in this country and in other countries. Some of the other countries are better than we are, I must tell you. Um, and then these are just some of the things I'm going to actually give you guys a chance to win the cookbook. But I want to know if there's any questions from anybody here. I know, yes. Oh wait, you know what? Wait, Anne. Let's let's have let's have some. Here you go. Just so we can at least see what they're saying and make it the most out of it for them. This on. For patients who are following the FODMAP diet long term, do you ever see any issues with like micronutrient deficiencies since it's so restrictive? Yes, so that's a very good question, and that's. That anybody's question would be good. That's a good question. Because the complete take out all FODMAPs is bad because the microbiome that lives in your gut needs to feed off of that. And what we've been learning is the microbiome is important for like almost everything. So you want to identify which category only that a person has a problem with. And you want to be able to figure out what the load, how much they can have in that category. Because if you take everything out and you leave everything out, you're not feeding your microbiome in a healthy way. So yes, there will be long-term issues with the healthy bio, the microbiome that lives in your body, if you stay 100% low FODMAP. It's not a safe thing to do long-term. It's not going to kill you, but it's not going to make you a healthier person either. So that's important. Yes. Oh, by the way, while we're doing this, my person that I made move. Um, why don't you pass this around? Tell people to write their name in it, and then I'll pick, I'll pick out a winner, and somebody will get a free gift. Do you have a card? You can put your card also. 
Go ahead. I'm sorry. Any other questions? Is there any? Yes. For the first step for a person that is experiencing anything is to do a low FODMAP diet and then introduce per category? For the first step when you're looking at FODMAPs? Yeah. So depending on who you talk to, there's two ways you can go. Number one, take them all out, leave them off, make a meal plan with all the FODMAPs out, pick one category at a time and add one food from that category and then two foods from that category and mark GI responses until you see which areas they seem to be able to tolerate more in and then just worry about the areas that they have problems with. Because usually it's total load, but sometimes it's more than one category. What I do is I usually take out gluten and dairy for like a week, because dairy is also hard to digest, and see if their symptoms, they still have symptoms, or if there's just a mild reduction or a major reduction in their symptoms. Because it might be just something simple like a lactose intolerance or, or, or just an issue with too much gluten in their diet. If they feel better but not 100%, then I start eliminating more. Um, sometimes people will just tell you what they're having a problem with. They come in and they say, I can't eat this or I can't eat that. And then what I'll do for those individuals is I'll just take out the category that it looks like they're having a problem with. Like I might, like they said, they can't, they say I get sick every time I have onions and garlic. I'll switch to the green onions and the garlic infused oil and tell me if they have a problem with that. And that will be an easier way instead of taking everything out. Because otherwise it could take you two months to figure out, you know, what somebody's not having. Or like, or certain time of the year, have you been eating more of something lately? Oh, I love those cherries. I'm eating cherries every day. So you put regular salad dressing on you. It might be the cherries plus the high fructose, or maybe they switched to agave because somebody told them it was healthy. So you just can try to, like, question a little bit. Or they're doing, or they just became diabetic. This is a good one. Not a good one. It's bad. It's bad. Bad, bad. They just became diabetic, and they went out and they bought all sugar-free products, and they are so, so sick. Well, sugar alcohols is one of the FODMAPs, and they weren't sick before. So now it's like, wait a second, what are you using? Which products are you using? What artificial sweetener is in those products that you're using? It helps you kind of figure it out without going to take everything out. If they said, I wasn't sick before, now you told me I can't have, I'm on a diabetic diet and I'm sick and it's your fault because I wasn't sick before. Well, what are you having that you didn't have before? Yeah. Ah, I have to shake it up now. You're like, bingo. See, now, I would, I would let one of you pick it, but then if you're the one that wins, it would be, like, really considered really bad. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to shake it up, and then we're going to the little pieces of paper, so I'm really mixing it well. Okay, I got somebody. And the winner is... Okay, I'm not going to say it right, but it's Man Oja. Ta da Yay, everybody, yay. So you can share the cookbook with everybody because we modified the recipes. They're all gluten-free, but we also modified it for FODMAP, and it also has every allergy listed in the back. So if you have any questions after today, um, I left some cards on the table. You can always email me. I will, but I'll find you. Anything else for today? I know it's been a little over, but we started a little late. Anything that... Well, it depends on what you can't eat. Like, there's a lot of fruits and vegetables that are low FODMAP, okay, that are no problem. There are a lot of grains that are low FODMAP. So you could have plenty of fiber. But if you go out and you buy a bar, let's say your fiber source was buying a bar that had, like, fiber added to it, like inulin or chicory, loaded with FODMAP. So you probably have to either buy from the low FODMAP companies if you're going to use things like that for your fiber, or you have to cook more. So that would be important. But, like, I can have beans if I have a low FODMAP problem, but I can't have a lot of beans. I could have some chickpeas, but I can't, the cans are better. Like, one of my patients wanted white beans, but she still wasn't tolerating it. White beans have higher FODMAPs than the chickpeas. So I told her to, to, to drain them, to put water, to boil it, to dump the water, boil it and dump the water again, and she was able to tolerate the white beans. And then when I talked to the doctor from, Dr. Gibson from Australia, because he was at an event with me, he said that, yes, they found that actually works now. Well, okay, I'll be around for a few minutes. Very nice. Thank you for being tolerant. Long day. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.